Happy Pentecost to you all. Happy Feast of the Holy Spirit. Have a kind thought today for the Holy Spirit. We see flashes of red through the year, but there are so few occasions when we stop and look directly at the Holy Spirit. It makes today a special day, a day when we ought to ask ourselves, well, what do we know about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is doing? Where do we see it? And perhaps even more worrying, how often do we miss it? It's tempting to think, well, the Holy Spirit is just something that those crazy people do in some other church. You know, I'm, sure, I'm sure you have seen the TikTok videos of people who otherwise look like they're normal, clean cut in their, their nice Sunday clothes, who suddenly are behaving very oddly when they feel the Holy Spirit come upon them. It's easy to say, well, that's what they do, otherwise it's not real. It's tempting also to say that it's Something trivial, well, we'll make it into whatever it was we learned in kindergarten. When we behave nicely and play well together, that's the Holy Spirit moving among us. No, I don't think that's it either. I think the Holy Spirit is a lot less polite and a lot more powerful than we imagine. Something wilder and more threatening. And it's worth it once in a while to stop and ask, where is that happening and what are we being told? Today, in the lessons, I think we get three examples of what the Holy Spirit might be and what the Holy Spirit might be doing. I want to suggest to you that those are the spirit of truth, the spirit of prophecy, and the spirit of life. Beginning with the spirit of truth. In the gospel lesson this morning, Jesus is talking to his followers about the spirit of truth. It's worth remembering for a minute what Jesus means when he says truth. It is not what you and I mean on a normal day-to-day basis when we say truth. Truth for us is whatever you can defend against anybody who might tell you you're wrong. It's whatever can be so constructed that, well, we can't figure out any reason why it's wrong, so it must be true. We can, I think there are no lawyers in the house today. No. No. <laughs> Stan is not, our house lawyer is not here today, so I can talk about lawyers. This is the way we do it in the legal system. Uh, Beyond a reasonable doubt, a preponderance, preponderance of the evidence, all these things that are saying, well, maybe it's not true, but we can't prove it's not true, so we're going to say that it is. That is not the truth of God. The truth of God is the creative property of the entire universe. It's what everything else is measured against. It's how we know the value of everything else. It's not anything that has to be defended. In fact, it's what cuts through all other truths to show us what truly is and is not godly. How many times do you think of truth that way as you go through your days? How often do you think of your faith as being the measure against which everything else should be considered. That is the truth that the Spirit is supposed to be bringing to us today, and we know that it is a truth that will not stand easily. Jesus refers to the world several times in the gospel lesson this morning for a good reason, because the world is over against that kind of truth and will do whatever it can to shut it down. Think about the way that we normally use truth. What we're thinking about are things that, that, that exclude or that define, that limit, things that, that cover up when we take a class or we have a meeting on some particular subject. We talk about it covering the subject. But what it's done is has enforced one particular version of what the truth is. That's what we go away with. Compare that with the truth of God. It uncovers It illuminates, it reveals, it cuts through everything else that the world will tell us is true to reveal where the truth of God underlies everything. This is important because many of the truths that we work with are things that the truth of God needs to shine on. We know that it is true that the person who has the biggest gun usually wins. We know that it is true that you can have just as much dignity as you can afford. At the same time, we know that the image and likeness of God is in every single person. How else but with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, cutting through 
the lies and falsehoods, the conveniences of this world, will we ever be able to see where true truth, true truth, that's a good expression, where actual truth lies? Yet that is what the Spirit is doing among us all the time. Jesus says that the Spirit is testifying. Here again, I can talk like I'm a lawyer. What is testimony? It's talking about what you know from your own experience, what you've seen and what you've heard. You can't testify to what somebody else knows or has seen or believes, only what you know. So when the Spirit testifies to us, it is about a true experience of God. If you need something that's a little bit less legal, imagine a composer or an artist. A composer has an idea in his or her head, writes it down as notes. Then every time that music is played, some version of what that artist imagined is revealed to us. Whenever a painter paints brushstrokes on a canvas, something that was in his or her head is being put out into the world. When we look at it, we have some idea of what it was that the artist intended. I know how hard this is, how many times I have tried to take the idea in my head and make it appear on paper or canvas or wood or whatever. It's not easy. And yet, somehow in that, there is something real that is revealed to us. This isn't just something, however, that happens in the air, it's not skywriting. These messages come to us, are revealed through us in the world by our faithful action. Every time we do something faithfully, we are in some way revealing the truth of God. It happens through us. The good news about that is, if that's true, there can be no failure. Everything that we do faithfully is in some way a revelation of the truth of God in the world. The truth will out, as they say in mystery novels. It will not be held back. It will not be denied. We can only do our small part. Turning then to the spirit of prophecy, we hear this in the Acts lesson this morning. The followers of Jesus are gathered together. The Holy Spirit comes upon them in some way, and they begin to prophesy. They begin to speak in other languages. They begin to tell of the deeds of power that God has done. What are those deeds of power? They're creation, transformation, restoration, but also bringing justice, draining the power from evil. These are the sorts of things that we are supposed to be declaring to the world all the time. We get a little distracted sometimes in imagining that prophecy is about fortune-telling, predicting the future. I prophesy that the stock market is going to go down a thousand points this week. I hope it doesn't happen. That's not what it's about. It's about, to put it in modern language, telling it like it is, speaking to the world about the way the world is and how far that is from the way the world should be in the image of God, how far from God's desire we are in much of what we do especially collectively. How often are we speaking about God's deeds of power? I'm going to bet it's more often than you think it is. I'll give you a really, really trivial example. This afternoon and tomorrow, I will be baking cakes for Hope Dining Room at lunch tomorrow. Every time I do that, I am being prophetic. Every time I do that, I'm making a statement about the conditions of the world being such that there's anybody who needs a free lunch. Think about that the next time you buy those little plastic cups of mixed fruit. Every time you bring one of those in here, you are being prophetic. Every time one of Father Clay's Nuri interns walks through the door, we together are making a statement about a world in which People don't have enough opportunity to exercise their God-given talents, don't have equal access to all the opportunity that they should have to become fully the children of God that they were intended to be. Blue Hen Bounty, Code Purple, Code Orange, the 
clothing donation baskets in the parish hall. I'm sure you can think of 50 more, and there are probably 50 more in this room that people are doing that I don't even know about. Every time we do anything that speaks to the conditions of this world as faithful people, every time we do anything that addresses anything imperfect, unjust, unloving in this world, we are being prophetic. What will you do today for the rest of the day that will be prophetic? I challenge you, go out and do something prophetic. I wonder what you would have said had you been in the Acts lesson this morning. If you'd been there with them and you were speaking of God's deeds of power, what would have been on your lips? Today is a day to unpack that just a little and to remember that each one of us is called to be prophetic. It's, it's a wonderful thing that Peter quotes from Joel. It seems very egalitarian. Men and women, old and young, those who are empowered, those who are not empowered, everyone is meant to prophesy. The Spirit moving among us enables us to do that. Turning then to the Spirit of life. We hear about this in the lesson from Ezekiel this morning. It begins with, with dry death. They're, they're just the, the bones in, in the valley. They appear to have no life in them. And it is true that something has to happen to, to revive them, to, to give them new life so they can do something new. But I want to suggest to you that there's more to it than just that. Those bones didn't start as, just as dry bones. They started as bones inside somebody. Bones don't just exist on their own. They exist as part of a living body. So all those bones have baggage. All those bones have, to come up with a new English word, formerness. They used to be something else, and they bring all that baggage with them. Ezekiel is talking about the condition of, of Israel, which by its wandering away from the ways of God has been sent into exile and feels dead, feels like the world has ended, their, their, their future is, is, is blank. And so, although something new will happen, they, they're, they're bringing all that past baggage with them, all of that disobedience, all of that wandering away, all of that they have brought with them, and yet the Spirit is going to do what the Spirit is going to do anyway. Our past will not prevent the Holy Spirit from creating the future that God intends for us. The Spirit will do what the Spirit will do in us and despite us, despite whatever it is we think we bring to the table that might hold us back. All of the, we tried that before and it didn't work of our lives. The Spirit's not interested. The, the trade, however, is, and there is a trade, is that the bones will then be covered. We no longer see them. They're still there. As they say in real estate, when a house is probably going to need some fixing up, it's got good bones. But get ready to take out a home equity line of credit to make it what it's supposed to be. God has already done that. God is ready to do that in our lives. The question is, are we so in love with the bones that we will prevent the Holy Spirit from doing it, or at least try? What bones do we have that need to be covered up? Are we willing to let them be covered up? Today is the day when the spirit of life is once again knocking on the door saying, here we go. Are we ready? That, dear friends, is what we celebrate today, that the Holy Spirit is already among us, already acting in us, already acting even though we might try to prevent it, leading us into all truth, leading us to speak truth to the world, leading us to new life. Thanks be to God for that today and always. Amen.